where the violated have Indian status, such as myself, the repercussions reflect in an, in an inability to pass that status onto future generations and decrease the numbers of our people. This practice is in all manners, nothing short of genocide. I no longer felt and I no longer feel like a complete woman. I was sterilized against my will when I was 29 years old. My circumstance differs as I was not only sexually sterilized, but also forced to have an abortion. The assigned Children's Aid Society worker demanded that they would, and I quote, take the baby one way or another. Those are words that I never forgot. It is my opinion that we will never adequately be able to determine the numbers of women and men, girls and boys that were sterilized in residential schools and in, in Indian hospitals. I say that to acknowledge the fact that this is, has been ongoing for as long as those institutes of genocide have been in place in Canada. So I asked if it was reversible. She said, yes. My name is Malika Pop. I'm the founding leading plaintiff of, of a proposed class action addressing the coercive sterilization of indigenous women in Saskatchewan. Nationwide, I believe that includes thousands of indigenous women across Canada. I'm a proud member of Fishing Lake First Nation of Treaty 4 territory, a loving mother of two children and a, and a citizen of the Anishinaabeg Nation. Today, I stand in solidarity with several survivors, with several Indigenous women whose human rights were violated during their labor and delivery. Our experiences are similar in that when Indigenous women were at their most vulnerable and exposed during labor and delivery, our basic human rights to, pre, to free prior and informed consent were compromised, which not only rendered Indigenous women sterile, but also forever removed generations of future unborn from ever receiving their inherent treaty rights. Where the violated have Indian status, such as myself, the repercussions reflect in an, in an inability to pass that status onto future generations and decrease the numbers of our people. This practice is in all manners, nothing short of genocide. In September 2008, prior to and up to my um, delivery, during and following the C-section of my now 13-year-old son, from a variety of healthcare practitioners, providers, I was interrogated, shamed, subject to systemic racial profiling, harassment, and was further marginalized and violated when I was forcibly sterilized. I was told that the procedure was reversible and that I didn't wanna be in this kind of situation again. Upon my release from the hospital on the following day after I brought my newborn baby home due to the birth alert, my son's human rights were violated when he was apprehended on his first day home by Child and Family Service. While I had the resources to access justice, to have my son return to my care. Many of the survivors who suffered the same fate did not and lost their children to the system of child and family service. Later, when I reviewed both mine and my son's child and family service file to my utter horror, it had read that prior to the birth of my son that he was earmarked for a permanent wardship as a survivor of coercive sterilization, next to, screening, next to screaming into the avoid, there are no words to describe the violation and powerlessness of having your cultural identity as a woman essentially sterilized. 
Such an inhumane, brutal act can only be compared to being gutted wholly alive. Your report in this study is hopefully followed by legislative and policy reform, concrete action, and acknowledging that the rapid and deeply harmful coercive and forced sterilization of Indigenous women must be actioned at the highest levels to ensure with respect for pre, uh, free prior informed consent of Indigenous women. Without legislation and policy reform, such Canadian laws that adversely impacted so many Indigenous women will continue to thrive on the foundations of colonialism. In solidarity with fellow survivors, I implore the Senate Justice and Human Rights Committee to right this historical wrong and to end the coercive sterilization of Indigenous women. It is my opinion that criminalizing this gross human rights violation is a critical step toward ending the um, disturbance of our people's survival as um, a distinct nation and toward ensuring justice, healing, and is a, and is a peaceful gesture toward lasting reconciliation for generations to come. To that end, we look forward to your feedback and we welcome any, any um, decisions on how best to build upon the foundation of this study to achieve justice, peace and healing. I thank you for your valued time, Ms. Chair, the Senate committee members and fellow servers across Canada. Megwitch. Sorry, this was her. I, I didn't anticipate being so nervous. Thank you. Literally you, 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 were, you were fine. You were, if you were nervous, we didn't see it. I'm I thank literally you. shaking. No. I'm, I can feel it. Like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you I for apologize. your testimony. Thank you. You, 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 you were great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll now turn to the next uh, witness, uh, Sylvia Takanao. Sylvia, the floor is yours. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Tuckenau, and I am a 49 year old free woman from Patikasi's First Nation in Saskatchewan. I have six children and 14 grandchildren, and I am also an Indian day school survivor. My parents and late husband are residential school survivors. <clears throat> Having a big family was my dream. I love my family to the fullest. My children tragically lost their father eight years ago. In his culture, they did not believe in birth control and being forcefully sterilized had a huge impact on our marriage, which ended in divorce. I no longer felt and I no longer feel like a complete woman. I was sterilized against my will when I was 29 years old. On July 9th, 2001, I went to Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon in active labor. I gave birth to a healthy baby boy with my late husband by my side. Shortly after the birth, I heard my husband in the hall saying loudly to nurses, I'm not, I'm not signing that. No one asked me anything or explained anything to me about what he'd been asked. And I'm absolutely sure that I didn't sign anything. As soon as my husband left the hospital, I was taken into an elevator in a wheelchair to another room. <clears throat> I can't recall if I went up or down as I was still disoriented from giving birth and the effects of pain medications. I was placed outside this room by the door. I managed to see into the room, which was unfamiliar to me. I automatically felt fear. So I started trying to wheel myself back to the direction of where the elevator was, but I didn't make it because a man came up behind me and wheeled me back towards that room. I told him I didn't want to do this, but he didn't listen. I didn't know exactly what I was objecting to at the time, but I had a terrible feeling because no one had talked to me about what was going on. I felt terror and fear as I was taken into that room. A few nurses surrounded me 
I don't know exactly how many nurses to prepare me for an epidural. I already had an epidural sticking out of my back from giving birth. So I wondered why they needed to do another one. I kept asking if the one already there can be used. I was trying to stall them, I believe, because I, kept, I was coming up with excuses. During this, I kept saying, no, I don't want to do this and crying uncontrollably, but nobody listened to me. I was completely ignored by everyone in that room. I was so vulnerable because my legs weren't working properly because of giving birth and having the first epidural. I was put in that bed in total fear. I kept crying and I was terrified. I was hyperventilating because of the position I was, I was in on that bed. My head was positioned lower than my body and they tied me down to the bed. I, I also could smell something burning, which reminds me of the smell of uh, singed chickens to this day. I asked the man doing the surgery if he was done a few times. He didn't reply until the procedure was done. <clears throat> when he was finished, he, he said, there, tied, cut, and burnt. Nothing will get through that. I felt relief that I was getting out of that room. I was taken back to maternity ward, and it was then that I got to hold my son. I can't recall if I held my baby before they brought me to the operating room to sterilize me, but I don't think that I did hold him. This terrifying experience left a void inside of me. I felt no longer a woman and I am terrified of hospitals and doctors. I didn't say anything to anybody because I thought no one would believe me. When Malika Pop, Brenda Palshay, and Roxanne Ledoux came forward, that's when I decided to come out with my story. I felt relief knowing that I wasn't the only woman this happened to. I lived this terrifying experience alone for 14 years. Now I'm telling my story to anyone and everyone who will listen. I was also involved with the external review that happened in Saskatoon. Everything I am doing is so important to me because I am advocating for other women to come forward and I know how scary and hard this is. When my daughter recently gave birth to my 14th grandchild, I could not be with her because of COVID restrictions. This caused me much anxiety and fear because I don't want what happened to me to happen to her. Our co-plaintiff co DDS is about the age of my daughters. So I know it can happen to my girls and their girls one day if something serious isn't done and I'm terrified. But we are not alone anymore. We will stand together we know women around the world who this has happened to, Peru, South Africa, and so many other places. I am standing up to protect our future generations and our nations from this genocide. We can't be scared of that word. Imagine all the little spirits who would be here in our lives to teach us and learn from us and to form the backbone of strong indigenous nations. What they did to me and my family and so many others was wrong and they need to be held accountable, including criminally for these horrendous, torturous and genocidal acts. Thank you. Thank you for that very powerful testimony. Uh, we will now turn to uh, Elizabeth Escrega. You, you have the floor. Bonjour, my name is Liz Escrega. I'm here to share my story with face and voice no longer hidden. I want to say miigwech to Honorable Senator Yvonne Boyer and Honorable Senator Adet, as well as lawyer Alyssa Lombard for their commitment and support. Also to the other members of the panel and the women, men and families also impacted by coerced and forced sexual sterilization. I attest that I was both coerced and forced to be sexually sterilized and to abort my unborn child simultaneously 
without full knowledge of the life impact, when coercion of, or force is used for the purpose of compliance, it is both unethical and morally wrong, to say the least. My story goes back to the late 1970s. I was a teen mom and did not grasp the gift of being a mother, or for that matter, pregnancy and all that entailed. While it is difficult to pinpoint actual dates, I do recall timelines and surrounding life events of which I will now share. My circumstance differs as I was not only sexually sterilized, but also forced to have an abortion. The assigned Children's Aid Society worker demanded that they would, and I quote, take the baby one way or another. Those are words that I never forgot. I also never forgot waking up after surgery with an emptiness and knowing that it was now an accomplice in terminating life, as this was something that I could not do willingly. For if abortion was a crime, I was now a partaker, not only against my unborn child, but against myself and the creator. I felt empty with my maternal instinct and God-given ability to bear life cut and ripped from me. These life-altering experiences preceded the sudden death of my mother in 1978. I had not experienced the death of a loved one before. I am sure that anyone who has lost a loved one will agree that grief is overwhelming as it takes time to heal. The loss of my mother deepened as it thrust towards me towards a greater loss. As I stated earlier, the life events are timelines and put into perspective what transpired. And although what happened is not right, I asked, when can we correct the wrong? I had no one to share the immense pressure put upon me by the social worker or doctor. I did not know what to do or where to turn as another life trauma was intensified and triggered. As a child, I was sexually abused and I understand the link between sexual violence and sexual sterilization. Both are just as harmful, degrading, shocking and traumatizing. More so the actions and words by the social worker and doctor are nothing short of a crime themselves. The contrast between sexual sterilization and abuse are aggressive with motivations of power and control. The way the CAS worker and the doctor treated me are akin to the traits of an abuser with their unwanted touches and the invasion of sacred parts of my body and being. They are like sexual predators in use of power and force over a person where the act leaves one feeling helpless. These acts went without complaint or investigation. Instinctively, I knew something was wrong, yet I had no alternative until now. I just lived with it and suffered in silence. I know that fear, shame, and guilt is associated with sexual sterilization and sexual abuse. Both are violent acts, and I internalize deep-seated fear, shame, and guilt. This led to a greater loss of my own being, as shame overtook my sense of self. I did not know then, but I know now, that sexual sterilization is part of the eugenics era or labels such as defective, unfit, unworthy were used, were words used to identify people for sterilization. To those who have never experienced this type of harm, will never understand, nor will they see the correlation between the sexual nature of the violence in the act. I see them because I live them. 
having internalized a lifetime. I know that sexual violence takes different forms, one of which is coercion. I suffer psychological effects on my overall physical health to this day. Sexual sterilization is mutilation, and my body has a degree where the scars I have are constant reminder, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I did not share the details of what happened with my family for over 40 years. I can finally come forward and say, this happened to me. And sadly, it has also happened to countless others and is still happening. There are times I think about the people who will never know the joy of having a child or grandchildren. And still there are others who have passed on without ever knowing or hearing their story made barren by sexual sterilization as a target where indigenous people. Despite all of this, I have two beautiful daughters and five grandchildren as the creator's timelines were far greater than theirs or mine. Creator has blessed me, and I know that there is no greater power. Honorable senators and listeners, while I have shared a portion of my life experience, I am resilient. I know that being an Anishinaabe woman in this world can be challenging and wonderfully beautiful. I see the beauty despite the ugliness that has happened to the Indigenous people both in Canada and the world. They may have cut my ability to bear more children and slash life from my womb, but my ties to the creator are aligned with grace. I hope that in sharing my story that it will empower others to come forward. In closing, there are 30 articles written in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly on 10th of December, 1948. Article one states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. In the same spirit, I thank you for listening. Miigwech. I would like to now introduce our second panel of witnesses. We have Morningstar Mehkadi, Nicole Rabbit, and Witness B, who is a registered nurse but who wants to remain anonymous. They are accompanied by Alyssa Lombard from Lombard Law. Welcome to all and thank you for being with us. Madame Mehkadi, you have the floor. I'm Thankful to the senators and to Alyssa Lombard and all those present for this opportunity. Before I say anything, I need to acknowledge the grandmothers, the aunties, the mothers, the women, the unborn children, the unborn generations of our children, and those grandmothers and aunties and mothers that are no longer with us but certainly have also been impacted within their own families, within their communities, impacted by forced coerced sterilization. Certainly in my family, I can say that that has and is the case with three generations of women. It would be inappropriate and disrespectful of me to not acknowledge the women that have gone before us and for their advocacy work that has been ongoing for decades for the human rights of indigenous metis and inuit women and women of color
my late Granny Annie had nine of her children in the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. Of all of her children, four survived. Of the four that survived, two or three were in the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital. And of those four, only two were able to conceive and have children. That was my late mother and my late aunt, Selene, my late aunt, Eva, and my uncle were not able to conceive. It is my opinion that we will never adequately be able to determine the numbers of women and men, girls and boys that were sterilized in residential schools and in, in Indian hospitals. I say that to acknowledge the fact that this is, has been ongoing for as long as those institutes of genocide have been in place in Canada and are currently ongoing now in 2022 and we will never be able to adequately determine the numbers of women that are being tortured and subjected to forced coerced sterilization. Not only from the perspective of a survivor coming forward to disclose this atrocity of genocide on her being, but also those women who have experienced forced coerced sterilization 10 years past, those doc medical documents, the medical documentation would, would not be accessible. As to myself and what happened to me when I was a 14 year old girl, pregnant. I'm choosing not to disclose the details of what happened to me because I can confidently say that you can read the book and the book is Sacred Bundles Unborn. Should anybody require any of the horrific details of the inhumane brutal torture and incident only in myself that I speak to of myself. You can read the details in the book, Sacred Bundles Unborn, which was published in this year. I have to say thank you to all the fire keepers and all the contributors to this book. It was not an easy task. The purpose for myself in writing this book, first and foremost, was that definitely it was the healing process. And certainly I felt the necessity to document by our perspective, our experiences with our voices before it becomes a commodified yet another survey or study. I can't tell you that I'm 58 years old <clears throat> and it wasn't until my 50s was I ever able to articulate or even speak to the trauma. And it was at that point that it was more than obvious to myself that I needed to surround myself with supportive, nurturing, compassionate, loving, understanding women, people in my inner circle. I had no idea at that time to the degree that this traumatic event, this genocide on my person impacted me to the severity that it had, which is ongoing. I struggle with PTSD and suicidal depression. 
let me make it very clear. I am not a victim. I have done absolutely everything humanly possible to nurture my spirit, to address my mental health crises when I was triggered with the memory of what happened to me. So, to those survivors out there, you are not alone. I stand with you in solidarity. And I acknowledge and thank all of the advocates and sisters in solidarity that stand beside all of us survivors of this act of genocide. This morning I was going through my Google news feed as I often do with my cup of coffee in the morning and I came across an article. Canadian ast astronauts cannot commit crimes in space anymore thanks to a new legislation. I thought, well, but forced coerced sterilization in Canada can occur by a surgeon who might feel by his biased and racial perspective that he has the right to discontinue a woman's right to conceive. Therefore, ending her DNA, her genealogical line for lineage. And he can do this, or she can do this, or these practitioners can do this with impunity. But thank God that Canadian astronauts don't have to, uh, they're going to be, uh, they're not going to be able to commit crimes in, in space. The scars that I carry in my soul and my spirit my body, I could never effectively articulate, whether through speaking or writing or otherwise, the impact. So yes, I am absolutely concerned that this form of genocide is allowed to be continued in Canada. And as we speak, there are women out there that will be subjected to this. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicole Rabbit, uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for allowing me to give um, my testimony. Um, it may be a little bit hard for me, as I haven't shared. Um, like, open like this. But I know, using my voice, and um, for the ones that can make a difference, I know it's going to... That, that's where the power is. Like, we need to tell our stories. So um, please forgive me if um, I have a hard time here. Um, I did tell my mom the story, what happened a few years ago when I did speak to Alyssa. Um, before that, uh, my partner knew exactly what happened, but... Um, Shortly after we had our baby, we separated. So I'll just introduce myself. Um, Oki Nidaniku Kidaki. My Blackfoot name is Eagle Woman. My English name is Nicole Rabbit, and I'm from the Blood Tribe in Southern Alberta. I have four children, two sons, two daughters, and three grandsons. I met the father of my children back in 1992. We had a 10-year relationship and four children together. Baby Allie was our last baby together. Our relationship changed after the birth of our fourth child, and we separated shortly after. 
Today, we have been co-parenting for 20 years. And to this day, um, we still call our baby, Baby Allie. The whole family calls her Baby Allie. So a brief um, introduction of where I come from or my family. Um, my paternal grandparents had six children. My maternal grandparents had seven children. My parents are both residential school survivors and had four children, me being the youngest. I come from a family of educators. My mom was the first educator in our family and has encouraged her siblings, her three daughters, myself included, one grandson, who is my son, and even her mother to pursue their Bachelor of Education. Some went further to receive their master's and PhD. Today, I'm currently caring for my elderly mother full time. Prior to becoming a full time caregiver, I was a principal for an elementary school for six years and a teacher since 2004. Now, I will talk about the day I was coerced to be sterilized. I was beginning my second year in the university at the University of Saskatchewan. My classes started on September 6, 2001, and I was scheduled to have my baby September 11, 2001. It was at this time a fellow student was taking notes for me and sending me my assignments because I didn't want to fall behind in my studies. Um, I was scheduled for a C-section on September 11, 2001 at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I was very anxious getting ready for the birth of my baby. It was early morning when we arrived at the hospital and I was taken into a room to check my vitals and given a gown. And then I was told to wait in the waiting room with my family. I sat in the waiting room with my partner, my mom and my uncle. And as I waited to be called into the operating room, it was at this time that my uncle brought my attention to the television. I asked what movie was playing and he informed me that it was the news and that a plane just finished hitting the World Trade Center. Minutes later, I was called to go into the operating room. In the operating room, I was given an epidural then my hands were strapped down on each side. I was given laughing gas to minimize my anxiety and a drape was placed in front of me. So I wasn't able to see the doctor perform the C-section. At this time, me and my partner were excited, excited and anxiously waiting for our child. We never asked about the sex of any of our children. As a reveal of our baby was part of the whole beautiful experience of welcoming a new addition to our family. The delivery was normal and we welcomed our daughter, baby Allie. My partner, my partner and I were, we were so happy. They took my baby and then they went and they cleaned her up and did the necessary things like weigh her and stuff. It was then that I saw the doctors and nurses leave the room. I still couldn't see anyone on the other side of the drape. I just knew my partner and I were left in the room and I was still fully exposed and open. <laughs> Some nurses and doctors returned. I could hear them talking. My partner, who was sitting on my left side by my head, told me that the delivery team was, were huddled at my feet. <sighs> A nurse then approached me and said, approached me on my right hand side and said really loud that I couldn't hold another baby and it was best that they tie my tubes. I was confused and I looked towards my partner. The nurse then turned to my partner and she said, she can't hold another child. It's in her best interest to have this procedure done. My partner reiterated, what the nurse had said. So I asked if it was reversible. She said, yes. Worry about that. <laughs> um, 
I had no time to think and I couldn't think clearly. The nurse informed me that I needed to decide. I was coerced into deciding, still being fully exposed, my abdomen still open from the C-section, my arms still tied down and numb. I felt pressured to say yes. Moments later, I could smell something burning and thought, did they just burn my tubes? Then the doctor proceeded to close me up. I trusted the medical team, but knew something wasn't right when I smelt burning flesh. These were strangers who I had no previous encounters with, who insisted I tie my tubes. The medical team took advantage of me in a vulnerable state. Hours after the delivery of baby Ali, I was having severe abdominal pains. The best way I could describe the pain is someone putting a torch to one side of my stomach. This pain came on quickly and lasted for like five minutes. And then it would move to the other side. I have never felt this kind of pain before and was given Tylenol 3 to manage it. Um, my longest stay in the hospital was with baby Allie, my last child. So as my stay in the hospital was longer than I expected, and I already started classes. I scheduled baby Allie's feedings at the hospital to make sure that I could make my classes. And I had a friend pick me up. The university was just east of the hospital, like two minutes away. Three, three years later, I received my Bachelor of Education and was valedictorian for my graduating class in 2004. No one asked me what I wanted. No one explained to me why I apparently needed this done and I didn't sign any forms. I still have no real idea the option, what the options were and why they said it was best for them to sterilize me. I know now that the sterilization can't be reversed. <laughs> and like I mentioned earlier, the relationship between my partner and I ended shortly after baby Allie was born. I was 28 years old when my womanhood was taken away by the hands of the doctors at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. My human rights were violated. My identity as a woman was taken away. I never decided I was done having children. Yet in a vulnerable state, I was pressured to having my tubes tied or burned. I'm not even sure how they did it because they never bothered to give me any information about the procedure. How is this consent tied down with an epidural, with my stomach wide open on the operating table? How could the hospital let this happen? How could the government let this happen? And why are none of the people who are responsible for what happened to me and what happened to the women you've heard from and will hear from not held accountable? Moving forward, it wasn't until I confided in my mother what happened to me to find out the same thing had happened to her after she delivered me in 1973 at the hospital in Fort McLeod, Alberta. She always said, I wanted more children. And today at 76, she says she always wanted a big family, which she will never have. She, men she mentions how this happened to other women on the blood tribe reserve. Some women only had one child and were coerced in to tie in their tubes. These women she speaks of turned to alcohol and pills to deal with their mental health and depression. My mother too also turned to pills, but thankfully she got away from that. She talks to me about how down she felt and how hard it was to be a mom and a wife after her ability to have children were stolen from her. My parents have separated as well. Um, and then just going further, um, this has also happened to my mother-in-law, my partner's mother. She had two children and was told she would die if she had another child. This is sad as my children have only one uncle on their father's side of the family. 
And as First Nations people, we are communal people. Our family take care of each other. What happened limited the number of family to take care of our family, especially our elderly. There are no words to describe that my family and I have lost because of forced sterilization. And I want to thank you for listening to me. And I'm sorry that I got so emotional. It was just, I haven't really told my story except to Alyssa and my children, my mom. And I just informed my dad a couple weeks ago. So it's it's very trying, but I appreciate um, allowing me to give my testimony, and I thank everybody for sharing, and it's very traumatizing. I know some are further along than I am in their healing, but I'm working on my healing now. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing uh, your story. And there's nothing wrong with uh, getting emotional. I think most of us sitting here, we're getting emotional and listening to the stories. Uh, I thank you for your courage. Um, our next witness is Witness V. So Witness V, you have the floor. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you today. As a registered healthcare professional, I know what informed consent looks like. It is due diligence whereby the physician ensures each patient is made fully aware of the risks, benefits, and purpose of the intended procedure. In the case of female sterilization in Canada, the nursing textbook states that appropriate counseling and subsequent signing of the legal document must occur 30 days before the procedure. College of Physicians and Surgeons also urge their members to document the discussions regarding this process. Most importantly, all literature regarding informed consent clearly outlines that capacity is a required element. Unfortunately, at the time of my sterilization, none of these fundamental aspects were present. One and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to peruse hospital documentation related to that day and I'm horrified. In August 2004, I had a spontaneous vaginal delivery, and I recall being asked if I wanted to have my tubes tied due to a cancellation in the surgeon's schedule. It is important to note that at that time, I was not a healthcare professional and did not know anything about the informed consent process. It is even more important to note that the documentation states I was in labor for two days prior to my presentation to the hospital, as it is well recognized how sleep deprivation creates incapacity and that life-changing decisions should not be made whilst in that state. Paired with blood loss, pain, exhaustion, and a lack of family presence, I find it unethical that I was even asked to make a choice about a procedure I did not know was permanent. Yet, Within two hours of giving birth, I was in the operating theater getting sterilized. The trajectory of my life has changed that day, and I experienced negative outcomes, including, number one, months of chronic pelvic pain, which I can now reasonably attribute to the specific procedure I, procedure I underwent, called bilateral partial salpingectomy. Number two, the breakdown of my marriage because of tension surrounding my inability to give him a biological child. And number three, regret due to having wanted another child several years later. Ultimately, I believe in Dr. James' reasons with cheese model of system failure. The harm that I experience requires major safeguards be implemented to ensure no other woman experiences this injustice again. Accountability is imperative. There should not be the chance for variability to exist between how each physician interprets the process of informed consent. As a registered healthcare professional, I firmly believe that every patient deserves autonomy, which includes the ability to be an active participant in choices that pertain to their bodies. 
informed consent is more than a legal document. It is a process with an ethical basis. Thank you for your time. Certainly I'm not aware of many women that have had to, or have been forcibly sterilized. But what I can say is that when this has come to my attention, working up north, I'm finding that there are a lot of women that are having, having their tube tied without knowing that it's permanent. And I've been making a concerted effort to educate the women about their reproductive rights. And it's, it's awful that these women, they have no idea. So it's happening, it's happening today. And we need to, we need to figure out actual solutions. My circumstances are slightly different because I am not visibly Indigenous. I do look Caucasian, but there is a simple matter that we in Saskatchewan on our health cards have a letter R. So it right away identifies the person as a registered Treaty Indian. So I do believe racism played a big part of my not being informed properly and ultimately being sterilized. When I first found out about this, um, this subject and then realized that I was actually one of the women that had this happen to her, I did speak out on social media when I first read about this and the way that I was attacked made me take it I I just I felt like I couldn't speak my mind I was called a liar I expressed that I was a nurse at that point when I found out I I had become a nurse and I knew about the informed consent process and I tried to explain that I did not get informed consent I had people not believe me just stereotype me as a drug addict or someone who had my children taken away and put into care. So women, especially Indigenous women and women that are minorities, they have, this is an uphill battle. And we need to look at downstream thinking more. I mean, upstream, upstream thinking to come up with solutions for, um, I guess, what I always believe is that education is going to be needed. We can't change racist attitudes that easily of adults or older adults. We have to kind of worry and, and teach and educate younger generations, get, get people earlier. So if we were to, I guess I'm going to kind of answer a question that was from the first panel um, on how we could try to put that, I guess, kind of slow down the, the process where people were able to just sterilize women. Um, if we were to, uh, to get funds that were allocated for education, of the prenatal mothers on their reproductive rights and money towards presentations that would go to um, teaching medical and, and nursing and social worker students. We have to get people early to be able to make, to create this awareness. Thank you. And so witness we can, can I just ask you a question? Uh, we. We know that uh, racism exists. We know that you know there's racist attitudes, but yet you felt when you spoke about what had happened to you, um, nobody wanted to know about it. Nobody wanted to believe you. Was that your experience? Yes, that was my experience. That, especially in the province where I live, racism is rampant. It's 
people don't want to move to Saskatchewan because the racism here is so extreme. And we know this and we see this all the time. We see this in the court system. We see this in, you know, the case of Colton Bushi. This is just Saskatchewan. So when I was, when I wrote what I thought was an eloquent um, response to try to foster more awareness that no, this isn't just, you know, women who are suffering the effects of intergenerational trauma. And then seeing the response from regular people and seeing the racism, it's, it's there, it's present. I see it every day in when I was a nurse in, in urban centers. And now I've chosen to go and work strictly in First Nation communities because I want to be that advocate. I want to make sure that things like this don't happen to other Indigenous people.